Hello, I'm Roger Citron, and I'm a professor at uh, Toro University, Jacob D. Fuchsberg Law School. And our guest tonight on the Toro Law Review podcast is Ellie Nachmani. And we're going to talk about a very important administrative law case that the Supreme Court decided earlier this year. This is West Virginia versus EPA. And before we get into the heart of the case, um, Ellie, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's really great to be here. My name is Ellie Nachmani, and right now I'm a law clerk to Judge Stephen Menashe on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. I should note at the outset that anything I, I say here, any opinions expressed are, are totally my own. Um, I'm a recent graduate of Harvard Law School, where I was the editor-in-chief of the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. Um, over the summer, I actually served as a senior research fellow at the C. Boyden Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State at George Mason University's Scalia Law School. Um, and on top of all that, I actually, uh, since May, have been an NFL draft freelance columnist for Sports Illustrated, which is kind of a, an interest a little bit outside the law and in some ways a little bit inside the law. There's a, a lot of ways in which sports and law intersect, but um, that's me, and, and I'm very much into administrative law, the separation of powers, the constitutional underpinnings of the administrative state. So uh, I was excited for West Virginia v. EPA to come down and even more excited to talk about it with you this evening. Um, thank you. I, uh, uh, the NFL piece, of course, is, is intriguing, but I'm going to put that to the side for now. Um, so that we can talk about our first love, administrative law and the uh, West Virginia case. Um, you know, I'm teaching administrative law this semester. And uh, one of the things that I said to my students to try and, you know, generate interest in that first week was the most important case decided by the Supreme Court last term may have been West Virginia versus EPA. What do you think about that assertion? I think it's an important case. I don't know uh, if we'll know how important it was for the next few years when we see how the court uh, employs the doctrine that the case now stands for, the major questions doctrine. I think it's difficult to say comparatively that it was the most important case decided by the court in October term 21. Obviously, you had Dobbs and Bruin, which were significant um, constitutional rights decisions. You know, I think if you if you ask a, an everyday American on the street, um, what does the Constitution mean to you? You know, it's it's something of a, a charter of individual liberties, and so I I think those decisions probably will will stand the test of time as the decisions that everyday folks will say these were the major cases that that came down during October term twenty one. Uh, but I think at least for administrative law scholars. Um, West Virginia v. EPA is up there. I'll also note there were a couple of cases in which we thought the court might overturn or at least chip away at the Chevron doctrine, right? Uh, American Hospital Association against Becerra, Empire Health Foundation against Becerra. Both of those cases turned out not to do that. Um, but at the same time, I think the implicit statement that the court made in both of those cases that there might not be the sort of appetite to overturn Chevron, at least right now, um, is quite important in and of itself, even if not explicitly expressed, right, in the in the opinions that the court issued. Yeah, there's um, something I read, I think it may have been by a professor out at Stanford, um, uh, who, Ann O'Connell, um, who wrote about uh, Chevron in, in this sort of, you know, in the current moment. And it's, I think her take on those cases was, well, they ignored Chevron. That is, I don't believe it's cited in either of those two cases. And there, she described a shift towards, we now try and, or, or the pattern seems to be to try and win at step one rather than at step two, which is, is very different from the world I inhabited as a lawyer for the Federal Communications Commission, you know, from 2000 to 2004, when it was, there's gotta be an ambiguity here somewhere. Um, so, uh, we may come back to, to Chevron, um, and how it loops, loop ties into, to West Virginia versus EPA. Um, the, can you set the stage for us and tell us, um, what the case was about and how major questions 
doctrine or canon um, yeah, informed uh, or influenced the outcome? Absolutely. So this case is a quite long running case and for students of, of the administrative state or folks who just pay attention to the shifts in presidential administrations and what those administrations do, um, you'll know it went back actually to the Obama administration's EPA, which imposed what it called the Clean Power Plan. And the Clean Power Plan, among other things, looked to uh, Section 111 of the Clean Air Act to set a few what they called best systems of emissions reductions. Essentially, a, an environmental regulation that uh, claimed as its source of statutory authority a provision of the Clean Air Act that some have described as a backwater or a little used provision of the Clean Air Act. Um, but what the Obama administration's EPA back in, I believe, 2015 attempted to do with this statute was to use it to justify a, a quite wide ranging plan that attempted to uh, ambitiously uh, attack the problem of climate change. And in some ways, you know, it, it very much reflected the priorities of the president and the presidential administration in charge in seeking to, across the board, shift away from energy sources like coal or like natural gas. Um, there was some back and forth. The, the courts in, in some way or another held this up. You got to the Trump administration eventually, which then said, you know, we don't want to do the clean power plan um, to, to put it simply, essentially, to set the stage here for um, the Biden administration taking over. And now you have the case comes before the Supreme Court. The Biden administration did not really appear to have any um, forward desire to bring the clean power plan back into existence. It wasn't exactly clear what the Biden administration would have done if they had won this case. And the court said, you do indeed have the authority to impose the clean power plan. Um, under this statutory provision. But essentially, you, you had a number of challengers, including uh, West Virginia and a number of other Republican-led states, or at least states uh, that have Republican attorneys general, where they said, among other legal challenges, and this is the, the important legal challenge for us here, is that the Clean Power Plan does not comport with the meaning of, of this backwater provision of the Clean Air Act. Why? Well, Maybe if you if you read the provision of the Clean Air Act uh, the most literally you possibly can, you might find this authority to impose a, a wide ranging plan that seeks to do what's called generation shifting, shifting our, our energy grid um, from you might call them dirty sources of energy or, or sources of energy that are disfavored by a lot in the environmental lobby to more renewable sources or you know what some like to call clean power. Um, and they said, you might find it if, if you read the statute literally, but here's a thought, Supreme Court. There's a few other decisions in which you've said, if an agency like the EPA or you know any federal administrative agency is going to do something really, really, really big, like the Clean Power Plan is really, really big, you might hesitate for a moment and check to see in this statute that the federal administrative agency claims gives it the authority to do this really big thing, did Congress speak so clearly that we're sure that the administrative agency has the authority to do that big thing? And I won't give it away what the court did, but uh, that essentially brings us to the case here. Yes, yes. And um, the there were arguments um, raised by, as you pointed out, it wasn't at all clear that President Obama's vice president, now our president, in fact, I, I think the, right, they tried to, in effect, I don't know if this is the intent, but to moot the case by saying, well, we'll just do a rulemaking. Um, and uh, nonetheless, the court took the case, um, and do you, we can get back and forth about theories about judicial review and the passive virtues and all those kinds of things. But why? Why did the court, you know, not take the off ramp? Um, why did it? You know, was it full speed ahead in in ruling on the merits? Yeah, absolutely. So there was something of a dispute 
as to what exactly the doctrine of what we call justiciability uh, was was at play here. So there, there's a few doctrines uh, that might get you to dismiss a case against the government if you're in the court. One of them is Article Three standing, which is this question whether you have an injury in fact fairly traceable to the party that's that's being sued um, that a, a favorable judicial decision would redress. That that's you know basic constitutional law Article Three um, cases or controversies requirements. So that. That was one thing that, that the government appeared to argue was that the parties didn't have standing to bring this case. But what really was the issue here was the question, was this related but not the same thing doctrine that you call mootness, which is whether uh, the case uh, is before the court in such a way where uh, the controversy still exists before the parties. Um, at, I think at one point it was called standing plus time. The court ultimately very, you know, swiftly abandoned that um, view of mootness. And now it's something of its own freestanding doctrine. And so, you know, if you take a step back, you might say, well, this was an Obama administration rule. Uh, the Trump administration took a different tack. And now uh, the Biden administration had said, you know, we're, we're going to maybe go in a different direction, but we're not going to fully commit to exactly what we're going to do. Um, and indeed, the court could have said, that's a nice off ramp, you know, dismiss on mootness grounds. Um, the court didn't do that. And in, instead, it cited and I think bolstered um, this carve out in a way to mootness that I think is, is quite relevant when it comes to government conduct, which is this idea of voluntary cessation, which is the government can say, we're going to stop doing this thing that you're suing us about. Um, oftentimes the government will do this because they don't want an unfavorable judicial decision uh, against them. And so they'll try to get the case out of the federal courts. Uh, but what the Supreme Court says here, and, and I think it's, uh, it's an important development in administrative law that has gone completely overlooked in this case, is that if the government engages in voluntary cessation in a way that might moot the case, you don't dismiss it as moot unless it's absolutely certain, absolutely clear uh, that the government is not going to engage in the in the wrongful conduct again. Um, I, I think these doctrines of reviewability, justiciability are going to become uh, at the forefront in the next few years because we're going to have these doctrines like the major questions doctrine. Um, there's going to be other ones, you know, the, the unitary executive stuff on the, the presidential removal power, all different kinds of ways. You know, we'll see what they do with the non-delegation doctrine as an example, which, which we can get into. Um, but there's going to be these, these merits doctrines on the books um, where if you, if you bring a meritorious claim against the government for doing something that, you know, may actually be quite ordinary for the administrative state these days, you're going to win. Um, and so the, it's going to, I think, push the question to, well, is the action that you're, you're attempting to review here reviewable, one, and is it reviewable right now, two? And I think the, the reviewable right now question is going to come up a little bit in, um, or actually it's, it's going to make up the center of the case, in cases like Axon and uh, Cochrane, which are going to be decided this term. So I, I think I would watch out for the, the justiciability and the reviewability doctrines because they're going to be quite important in the years to come. Yeah. Do you, like, where is that coming from or why now? In other words, and I kind of, you know, one explanation could be, well, it's the composition of the court, that is, um, or the other one could be, um, uh, this is a particular moment in the relationship between the court and the political branches or the court and the administrative state. And I just, um, you, you flagged something interesting. And um, I just wanna see if you have thoughts about, you know, the development, uh, the, the development of the significance of these justiciability doctrines and, and sort of why they're, because I, I think you're right, that they are going to be more significant um, as we move ahead. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think any, person who litigates against the government regularly is, is all too familiar with the justiciability doctrines because the federal courts have a million different ways to dismiss your lawsuit against the government without getting anywhere near the merits and saying anything about the underlying 
agency action or government action at play. I think for a while, the, the federal courts took a very dim view of, of challenges and uh, especially on justiciability grounds, were able to uh, dismiss cases, whether it was standing or finality or ripeness or mootness or all the sorts of doctrines I'm sure that you teach your students in administrative law. It seems today that this court is quite solicitous of rights claims against uh, the administrative state or other sorts of claims against the administrative state. And so I, I don't know that I would call it a, a loosening or a tightening of the, the justiciability doctrines, but I do think that, that something is going on with justiciability that is uh, maybe a little bit more technical and a little bit more uh, out of the, the public domain. Because, you know, for example, the court uh, says we're going to declare a, a federal statute unconstitutional because it, it delegates legislative power to the executive. You know, that, that's something that I think would be, would be headline news. But if, if the court says, you know, I think we can just review this case, we can just hear it. And I'm not going to tell you how we're going to decide, but, you know, the, the party has standing to bring it. Well, that doesn't go to the heart of the issue. You know, I, I don't know that, that there's going to be as much opportunity for, uh, you know, backlash or, or what have you from the political branches of the public with just the idea that, that we can hear these cases. And in fact, there, there's a good amount of, of developed literature, including, you know, literature from more left-leaning legal scholars that takes a, a more solicitous view of, of doctrines like standing. It was, I think, Justice Douglas once who became famous for the idea that maybe the trees have standing uh, to, to bring lawsuits. And so I, I think we're going to see probably a, a shift in the merits doctrines, but you know, don't take your eye off the ball. The the reviewability stuff are, is the is the set of doctrines that has kept a lot of these cases out of federal court in the first place. Yeah, well, we know that in 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 West West Virginia versus EPA that in fact um, the court did go to the merits, and uh, now I think we can say a little bit about. Uh, how the case was decided, um, and I'll I'll sort of you know turn it over to you with just we had a, a three authors that is to say uh, Roberts writing for a majority, Chief Justice Roberts writing for a majority, um, Justice Gorsuch's concurrence, um, and then uh, six three with Justice Kagan writing um, a dissent, joined by uh, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Breyer. So. Uh, you know, from left to right, going across our screen, uh, what did the court hold? Yeah, so I, I, we should start with the, the majority opinion, which is now the law in the land. Uh, and that is that there are certain extraordinary, well, we should start. The Supreme Court said that the EPA did not, in fact, have uh, the statutory authority to impose the clean power plan via this seldom used backwater provision of the Clean Air Act. That's the official holding of the case. And I, I think it's important when, when folks talk about like, what is the holding of, of West Virginia v. EPA? It's that the, the rule was promulgated in excess of statutory authority. Now, the, the rule that the court applied to reach that holding is the reason that everybody is talking about this case. The, the Clean Power Plan was more of an Obama era um, approach to environmental regulation. I think, you know, there are some folks in the current executive branch who have a, a more wide ranging conception of what environmental regulation from the executive branch should look like. But the clean power plan was, was something of a by the way to uh, articulating this broader rule of statutory interpretation, essentially the way that we are supposed to read federal statutes. And that rule is this, that there are certain extraordinary cases in which a federal administrative agency has made a claim of authority that a federal administrative agency has said, we have the power to do X thing. And that thing that the federal administrative agency says that a statute tells it it can do has real economic and political significance. You might call it deep economic and political significance. That the breadth of that claim of authority is quite massive uh, and that the agency is purporting to, to regulate uh, concerning 
a major question in our society. Um, the, the idea of what our energy grid is going to look like writ large, you would call a major question um, in, in our uh, basic political parlance. And so the court uh, recognizes that it, it has applied this sort of doctrine in, in past cases, but finally, in this case, formally articulates it. It calls it the major questions doctrine. And it says, in those extraordinary cases that we just discussed, those extraordinary cases where the agency claims this, this authority um, of great breadth and great significance, we're going to, to take a moment, we're going to take a step back, and we're going to ask, did Congress speak clearly in authorizing uh, that authority that the agency claims it has? Now, by the way, maybe it did. You know, the, the major questions doctrine is not the agency made a broad claim of authority. That can't be right. You know, we, we set aside the rule. We, we can get into a, a discussion of what it means to set aside a rule and the, the universal vacater and the like, but it, it, hold it here. The court is not saying that, that the agency can never regulate broadly. All it's saying is that we're looking for something of a clear statement from Congress, that it's, it's obvious that this statute conferred that sort of broad authority. Um, and just, there's many ways that, that Congress can do this. It, it can explicitly authorize a, a certain agency action. Um, it can, and this is you know where where you start to get into the question of is this still textualist? Uh, we can look to what did the agency do immediately after the statute was passed? What sorts of authorities did it claim? Uh, we might look to has Congress in the intervening years attempted to pass a, another statute explicitly authorizing this broad thing the agency claims to do, but fail has failed to do that. Um, has the executive, uh, you know, as a uh, through a, a, an official acknowledged that the uh, agency in question does not have that authority, maybe in congressional testimony or, or what have you. Um, they, they might even look to a press release that the White House puts out. So, you know, any folks who want to be White House communication staffers, uh, watch out. Don't, don't say it's too broad, uh, the authority you're claiming. But essentially, the court says separation of powers principles and, and a practical understanding of, of how uh, legislatures work and how legislatures, for lack of a better term, legislate, uh, compels this result that when the agency says it can do something big, we make sure Congress has said clearly that it can before we let it. That's the major questions doctrine. Yeah, no, this is a nice um, distillation of both um, the, the majority's decision, um, the, the, the decision by Chief Justice Roberts, as well as um, a summation of the uh, major questions doctrine. There's, we can turn to, to the other two decisions. There's a number of points that Justice Kagan made in dissent. Um, and we can get to those. But one thing I want to ask is, um, and I think this is part of what Justice Kagan was arguing that in dissent. Um, and didn't Congress make this, didn't Congress make this decision or this delegation sufficiently clearly originally in prior legislation? I think is it, is it the 1977 amendments? Um, uh, and um, and the reason why I, I ask is, um, it, you know, I was talking this through with some colleagues, including an environmental uh, professor who teaches environmental law. And the thing that struck me, I don't know that they agreed with me, but the thing that struck me is that, that is, we, we ask the EPA, that is its mission in some ways, is to straddle a major question, which is commerce or economic development or economic growth on the one hand, and the externalities, that is how we, we the public, are affected by that. Um, and so um, I'll ask the question to you, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to defend the court's opinion. I think you agree with, you know, I think you agree with it. But, but uh, you know, how much of that was played out, if you will, um, in the majority and in Justice Kagan's dissent? I, I, I'll, 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 that's the question. <laughs> I'll stop there. Yeah, I thought the majority in Justice Kagan's dissent had quite a robust back and forth. I think a, an underrated back and forth is the uh, 
tussle between Justice Kagan's dissent and Justice Gorsuch's concurrence. But but what I will note about the way that this played out is, it's like I said before, you might read the text as, as literally as possible, which sounds quite textual as, you might read it as literally as possible and say, yes, th there is such a delegation of authority. Two responses. The first is that applying this major questions, what you might call a major questions canon of statutory interpretation. And I've, I've actually written that I think there are three major questions doctrines. There's the major questions canon. There's a major questions carve out to the Chevron doctrine of, of uh, judicial deference to administrative agency interpretations of law. And there's another major questions doctrine that has to do with when we should even do non-delegation. But we're talking about the major questions canon of statutory interpretation. And that canon counsels that even if it, it might seem on its face that uh, Congress has given a, a certain authority to an administrative agency, we want the statement to be sufficiently clear in a way that will give uh, everyday Americans confidence that this sort of authority has indeed been delegated uh, to the administrative agency. There are clear statement rules that we apply in other uh, sorts of contexts. One that um, the majority, or at least Justice Gorsuch's concurrence, uh, discusses at length is the idea that we need a clear statement if ever we're going to evaluate uh, in a serious way congressional abrogation of state sovereign immunity. So if, if Congress purports to say that the uh, state can be sued, uh, then we want to make sure that Congress has uh, clearly authorized that. There, there's a federalism backdrop to, to that idea, but nevertheless, uh, we do clear statement there. Uh, we do clear statement actually in uh, the cases where we ask whether uh, Congress has conferred a private right of action under a given federal statute. So there, there's other clear statement rules uh, that we do in law. Uh, and, and Justice Gorsuch in his concurrence traces the idea of this sort of clear statement rule with respect to major administrative agency action uh, all the way back to 1897. Now, that's not 1787, but it, it, you know, it's 1897, so at least 120 or so years back. Um, so that's the, that's the statutory answer, right? Just like on the, on the doing of statutory interpretation, um, you might have to get there to the majority's view, uh, contra Justice Kagan, via this idea of if Congress is going to authorize the administrative agency to do something major, we want it to speak more clearly than in a, a little thought of provision of the Clean Air Act, regardless of, of what that uh, law may seem to say, or that provision of law, I should say, may seem to say out of context of the rest of the statutory scheme. So that's one answer. The second answer that a lot of scholars have, have talked about, and I think the court hints at is this idea of another canon of statutory interpretation, constitutional avoidance. Constitutional avoidance is the idea that before we say that a statute is unconstitutional, and you know whether we we dec we decline to uh, give it enforcement or we enjoin an administrative agency or an executive actor or whoever from enforcing it. Um, we're going to try on any other possible ground we can to read that statute in such a way as to make it constitutional. Now, we're not going to give the statute a construction that its, its text cannot bear, but at the same time, we're going to try really, really hard because we don't like declaring federal statutes unconstitutional. If you need an example as to why, you should look at the, you know, the, the declaration of statutes during the New Deal as unconstitutional and President Roosevelt's court packing plan, there's some back and forth on whether Justice Owen Roberts actually switched his vote in response to the court packing plan. I think the consensus has become he didn't. Nevertheless, that whole episode stands as an idea of like, we should do constitutional avoidance. Otherwise, we might not continue to have a, a federal court system, or at least one that, that looks the way that it, it does. You know, so we, we should at least be really careful about declaring federal statutes unconstitutional. And, and the court, by the way, does. Um, but applying the canon of constitutional avoidance here, we might say that, OK, yeah, sure, Congress delegated this, in effect, legislative power to this administrative agency. And then you might take a step back and say, wait, that that sounds unconstitutional. And, you know, what, what you might get to if you're if you're doing this in an intellectually coherent manner 
is that the statute actually violates the non-delegation doctrine. And so in, in some ways, people call the major questions doctrine a, a doctrine that has a relation to uh, major questions, non-delegation, you know, back and forth. The reason for that is, is because in, in a lot, by the way, not all, but in a, in a good number of these major questions cases, if it's the case that Congress did make that delegation, then the second argument that these litigants usually raise is then, you know, then that violates the non-delegation doctrine is probably right. Or at least it's it's probably right under the, the way that a good number of justices now understand the non-delegation doctrine. So I think two answers. One is, you know, ordinary canons of, of clear statement interpretation. The other is the, the harder one. It's the it's the constitutional avoidance that there's something else going on, you know, beneath the surface here that the court, you know, is is preventing itself from doing something that some might call radical or that that might get the composition of the court's personnel changed um, and, and deciding not to strike, or I should say, declare the federal statute unconstitutional. Um, yeah, no, and you've actually, so well, let's do the decisions. And then I kind of want to do like a little bit of a thought experiment um, about the New Deal, um, which I think is, you know, in, in play in some sense. Um, and how much so is really raised by your prior your, your last two comments um and, you know in particular the, the discussion of constitutional avoidance um i before we get to gorsuch because and i'm sort of channeling my discussion with my with my two colleagues um um one of them said uh you know there's this real sort of clash um, in the best sense, between Roberts and Kagan, um, they are really sort of, you know, litigating fully, thoughtfully, thoroughly um, an exercise in statutory construction about, um, you know, the Clean Air Act in particular, um, Section 111. Um, what do you think the key points of Justice Kagan's dissent were? One of them, I think, you know, you sort of, if you will, bait the hook, right? Is because you said, as, as she says, um, uh, we're not all textualists now. I thought that was true. Um, and it's said in a very, I think, pointed way. Um, uh, and so that's part of, of, of her dissent, which would be, I think, the paraphrase from what you said. Um, I'm reading the statute as a textualist and the rule is authorized uh, for the reasons she sets out in the dissent about, you know, the language in the statute and a system um, that this is authorized, this is within the power of the EPA. What were the other key points of her dissent? Um, and yes. Yeah, so I think Justice Kagan makes the point, and, and I think there's the, the political backdrop of, of, or at least what Justice Kagan believes to be the political backdrop of the way the court is engaging in statutory interpretation, in this case, vis-a-vis -vis other cases, and then there's just the law. I think if you read Justice Kagan's dissent fairly, there is this idea that the uh, justices who were in the majority have uh, a general anti-administrative state bent to their, their jurisprudence. And depending on, on how you read Justice Kagan, that might just be uh, based in a view of what the Constitution and statutory interpretation demand. You might also read Justice Kagan to be saying they just are more libertarian than, you know, than uh, justices in the past. They don't like the administrative states. And the way in which they're engaging in adjudication is reflective of a, a bias against uh, the administrative state and agency action and the like. Um, I don't think we're, we're going to find the answer to that debate this evening, uh, as, you know, what the court's doing and, and why it's doing it. I, I tend to take the court very much in good faith and um, find them to just be doing law. Uh, and I think particularly in, uh, you know, Chief Justice Roberts's majority, he, he goes through the, the reasons why we would uh, accord a certain 
skepticism to agency claims of broad authority in a way that comports with, with precedent. And, uh, and I think Justice Gorsuch nicely adds history and tradition uh, to that way of exercising statutory interpretation. But Justice Kagan says, look, you know, it seems that we have textualism, you know, and everybody was a, a fan of Justice Scalia. And so we, we do textualism in the mine run of cases. You know, we, we eschew legislative history today. We start with the text. In many cases, we end with the text. Um, you know, and, and we, we bring to bear these traditional tools of statutory interpretation. Uh, and, you know, we, we find the result that best comports with the statute that's before us textually. But, and this is the important but with Justice Kagan, is she says, it seems as though there is developing a, a carve out, almost a, a set of exceptional cases. You might call them in some extraordinary cases. And it seems like those extraordinary cases in all of them, it's a federal administrative agency trying to regulate, in particular, trying to regulate in a way that, uh, that has particular political consequences or um, may seem to be a, a claim of authority that uh, some of the justices might be uncomfortable with, uh, you know, if, if you make an assumption about what their political priors are. And it seems the major questions doctrine, a, at least in the, in the telling of Justice Kagan, is something of a naked statement that, you know, we have textualism, but then there's the extraordinary cases where we don't have textualism. And, and Justice Kagan calls this a, a get out of text free card. Now, Justice Kagan's dissent has actually found some support on the right. And the, the article, if anybody wants to do further reading that I would point folks to is Chad Squidieri, who's now, a, a, I think, an assistant professor of law at, at Catholic Law School, uh, has put out a piece in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, criticizing the major questions doctrine on textualist grounds. Uh, I think Professor does a, a really nice job putting that together. I, my thought on the, the major questions doctrine is usually when we do textualism, particularly when we're imputing canons of statutory interpretation into a, a textualist analysis, right? We start with the text, but if it's ambiguous, we might employ canons of construction or canons of interpretation, whatever you want to call them. Um, there are certain canons that we might call the linguistic canons that that obviously we use um, old principles of statutory interpretation. One of these is, uh, I'm gonna botch the Latin, but I think it's expressio unius est uh, exclusio alterius, where if Congress says one thing, we assume that it, it meant to exclude the other thing. Um, there, there's other such canons. Um, and then there are what we call the substantive canons of statutory interpretation. Uh, one of these is, for anybody who's taken criminal law, you'll know about the rule of lenity, which is we typically construe uh, statutes in a way that is, uh, you know, more favorable to criminal defendants, that more permissive of conduct that otherwise would be criminalized in a, in a way of being fair to folks, you know, who want to put on notice that certain conduct is illegal. My, you know, thought on how this probably should work is that you might go back to the ratification of Article Three of the Constitution, you know, at the founding, and you might ask when the framers ratified Article Three and conferred the judicial power of the United States on the federal courts, what did the framers understand the judicial power of the United States to mean? And you know, as a corollary there, that certain canons of interpretation were understood as within the exercise of the judicial power. Um, lenity was a, a canon of statutory interpretation that long has its roots in the Anglo-American common law. So you'll find in English common law prior to the founding, the application of the canon of lenity. The major questions doctrine, I don't know. I think there's going to be more historical excavation here. Justice Gorsuch goes back to 1897. Uh, Lou Capazzi, who's a, a recent Justice Gorsuch clerk, has a piece coming out in Ohio State uh, that acts, I think, essentially, it's, it's going to end up being seen as a, a defense of the major questions doctrine. That's probably what the, the piece will end up standing for. It's a really good uh, piece, and I think he's put it up on SSRN. Uh, but he traces back the lineage of the major questions doctrine. But, but my 
real thought is, you know, when the when Article Three was ratified, what did the framers understand that ratification to confer? And was a given canon of, of interpretation um, suffused in that, that grant of the judicial power of the United States? If it was, it's legitimate to apply it. If it wasn't, maybe it's not. Yeah, and I think this, this kind of brings up though, um, for me, yeah, but what about the New Deal? Um, and uh, uh, there's, and I think there's a couple, you know, pieces to that 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 um, you know question. Um, one is, and I actually before I go into Justice Kagan's dissent, which sort of sounds themes very familiar, you know, that that are straight out of, if you will, the New Deal justification for the administrative state. But even before we get to those, um, I'm always struck when I teach administrative law um, by uh, Justice Scalia's decision in um, the Whitman versus American trucking or the American trucking case, because um, it's about as, you know, it's a very sort of either acceptance, endorsement, recognition of um, the intelligible principle idea with these very broad delegations um, and things like, again, going back to the Federal Communications Commission, we regulate the airwaves in the public interest, good enough, um, you know, uh, and really, I enjoy saying to my students, what do you think that means? Um, <laughs> tell me what's intelligible in, in that, you know, formulation. Um, nonetheless, um, you know, and again, that's that's 2001, so more than 20 years ago. But still, you know, it's Justice Scalia writing for, I think, a, a close to unanimous court. It might be unanimous or it might not. I, I really can't remember what the, what the vote count was in the case. Um, and I sort of, you know, my shorthand of that is, I'm not overturning the New Deal. I'm not going to repeal the New Deal. You know, um, with Justice with Justice Scalia writing that for, uh, you know, not just a five four court, but a, uh, you know, an eight one or you know court or a nine zero court, whatever the num number turns out to be. Um, and yet, um, and so, and then, and then, of course, we get into you know Justice Kagan about expertise and institutional capacity. You know, the reason why Congress may very well knowingly um, delegate to the extent that it can um, uh, important um, policy type decisions. Um, and uh, and so um, the, the way this sort of co comes back, I think, is um, in the six, in the, in the six who were in the majority here, how do you think they feel about the New Deal? Um, I think, uh, I think uh, as, a, as a sort of opening bid, I would say that I think um, Gorsuch and Thomas are, are quite underwhelmed by it. I don't think they find it uh, to have, you know, much normative force in the same way that, for example, Justice Scalia did back in 2001 in American Trucking. Um, let me let me stop there um, since I'm supposed to let you talk. Um, but 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 I think I. You know, where do you see someone like Roberts? Um, where do you see someone like Alito? Um, uh, and, and, I, and really, the, the other two, of course, Kavanaugh and, and Justice, um, you know, Amy Coney Barrett. Yeah, so I think figuring out the, the individual views of the various justices on the court on some of these questions is actually harder uh, than you might think. So I, I think, you know, for example, you had, uh, there was a recent non-delegation case where Justice Alito could have joined uh, a dissent, decided not to, uh, and said, if a majority of the court is willing to reconsider uh, the court's non-delegation precedents, I would be interested in that effort. But you know, until there is a majority, I, I'm not going to, to do it right now. Um, I don't think that Justice Barrett has been on the court long enough really for us to, to get a sense. I think uh, Justice Kavanaugh and to some extent Chief Justice Roberts for a, a good amount of their career have been skeptics of a, a good amount of the administrative state. We trace it to the New Deal, I think, in popular parlance. But Justice Gorsuch makes an important point that it actually wasn't the New Deal that inaugurated this uh, different approach, I think, to the way in which administrative agencies can act under the Constitution. It really can be traced back to the, the ideas and the principles of Woodrow Wilson, who was the ultimate administrativist. 
Uh, he very much believed in the idea of uh, experienced bureaucrats who, who had particularized subject matter expertise that we could turn to and we could send our, our most pressing problems as the nation became uh, increasingly complex in the early 1900s. You know, you'll, you'll see a good amount of literature from around the, the 1910s to the 1920s starting to lay the groundwork for this shift that we had toward uh, government by administration. This wasn't something that just, you know, I think miraculously sprung up out of the New Deal. Um, you ultimately do get to President Franklin Roosevelt and, and he establishes, you know, what some have called the alphabet soup of administrative agencies. Um, really, once you, once you got to that point, um, it very much changed the way in which we understood the relationship between the separation of powers and the exercise of uh, government power. Mm -hmm. at, at one point, I think we were quite comfortable with Congress making the, the exact legislative specifications and choices for uh, things that govern our day-to-day our -day lives. There was a time at which it, it became, I think, in some ways convenient to, to delegate that sort of power to administrative agencies. Uh, the court, in some way, you might say, fought back or at least uh, stood in the way of this growing and emerging consensus dur during the New Deal era. That's how you got cases like uh, Schechter Poultry against the United States or Carter against Carter Cole. Um, and those decisions really laid the groundwork for President Roosevelt saying that the Supreme Court is declaring my New Deal unconstitutional in contravention of the will of the people, right? Congress has, has passed and I have signed uh, these pieces of legislation that, that may take a, a much different view of the exercise of government power than you know, we might be used to. But at the same time, uh, I have a popular mandate. He goes on to win a massive electoral victory in 1936. And shortly thereafter, he uh, I believe it was a fireside chat where he talks about this plan to uh, maybe call it pack the court. I don't think he was, he was too fond of that term, but um, in, in essence, Roosevelt's plan to uh, alter the personnel of the court, or at least uh, impose some sort of 10-year limit where you'd add more justices. It's, it's they, need, they need to keep up with their work. They need to right. keep I, up I with their work. That was the rationale. It's um, complicated right. what he exactly proposed. Um, but in any event, you know, you, you look back on that time, and I think the court saw that it was it was standing in the way of, of popular opinion. You know, one of the, the major maybe problems of the New Deal era was that they never formally amended the Constitution in such a way to permit the exercise of this power. And so we still do have Right, Article One, Section One, saying that uh, all legislative powers here and granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, um, as opposed to uh, you know all legislative powers. Yeah, they're vested, but you know Congress can delegate them according to expertise and the like. And for a while, we we had something of a consensus. The court backed away from the Declaration of Federal Statutes unconstitutional. Um, the intervention of World War II turbocharged the economy, and I think the court, anytime we're in wartime, becomes far less solicitous of uh, challenges to government action. And so some folks call the, the Yakis case in 1944 as maybe the end of uh, the, the constitutional skepticism about the New Deal. Um, and so you, you really had this confluence of factors that all came together and, and gave rise to what we know as the, the modern administrative state. Now, fast forward to today, and the administrative state is, is far bigger, uh, is far more, you might say, bloated today than it was in the 1930s and 40s. You might say that we've taken um, the rationale of administrative expertise and we've, we've stretched it farther than uh, the, the rationale might bear. Some folks have argued that uh, today it's, it's not, in fact, the uh, experts in the administrative agencies who are making these sorts of decisions, or to you know, to borrow from the Chevron context, who are actually promulgating the the relevant interpretations of statutes that we say are are crafted by experts, but really it's the agency's political masters who are who are dictating from on high. This is the way we want the administrative agency to go about doing its work. We're going to claim the democratic mandate as opposed to leaving it in a, a today's sclerotic Congress. 
um, an agency, dress it up with science and do the political thing we want you to do. Um, the, the democratic process, I think in, in some ways has broken down. Congress does not do as much legislating today. And so in some ways it's harder for there to be accountability, regardless what you think of the expertise rationale. Um, but I, I think today we're, we're at a bit of a crossroads and we have a Supreme Court now that's become a bit concerned of, of that breakdown of what at one point really was a, a consensus in the country that, you know, we, we might have some delegation, but we're going to uh, put up guardrails for procedure. We're going to put up certain guardrails for uh, participation in the democratic process. Um, and so, you know, you might say in one sense, we've gone too far, uh, or some others might say, I don't want compromise. The whole thing is unconstitutional. And if, if we're not, you know, calling it as we see it, we're not properly exercising the judicial power of the United States. But I think that's where we are. Mm -hmm. you, um, Gorsuch's concurrence, because I, I think this is actually, um, it, it may fit in here in the sense that um, uh, he really does seem to be, I think more than Roberts, really trying to articulate a major questions doctrine or, or canon um, in the sense of, uh, you know, here's when, here's when we know we have such a case and here's how we know when Congress has, has spoken clearly. Um, did, uh, do you think he's, you know, you know do, do you think he's sort of like the key person here or rather, he's, you know, sort of staking out the ground and we, we just have to wait to see who follows, if anyone does. Yeah, I think the question is going to be whether lower federal courts follow, whether the Supreme Court itself follows, um, because what, what Justice Gorsuch does in this concurrence is he lays out a very easy to understand, very citable, uh, almost a three-step process of here's how you know if we're, if we're doing major questions right now. Um, I think that's important, right? I think to have some idea of what major questions look like um, for Justice Gorsuch's concurrence in some ways might stand the test of time. And so I, I think the Justice Gorsuch concurrence, we have no idea whether folks are gonna cite it or not, um, but it's, it's quite clear in the way that it, it lays out the doctrine. Yeah, yeah, no, I thought it was important to uh, assign the whole thing to my students um, because of, um, really the elucidation or, or the articulation of what he believes it's about. And, um, and we will see. Um, have, we, have we missed anything? I, uh, is there anything that you, uh, that you think we should be talking about in connection with the case? Um, or, or actually, let, let, maybe we can go here. Um, maybe we can go to the Chevron. Maybe this is the time to sort of bring the Chevron question back. Sure. Because um, do you think major questions make Chevron irrelevant? That's a good question. So I think, you know, we, we should think about, you know, the different kinds of major questions doctrines. And, and this case, West Virginia v. EPA, stands for one iteration of the major questions doctrine. The idea that the major questions doctrine is a canon of statutory interpretation, a way that we're supposed to review federal statutes. There is another major questions doctrine, um, King v. Burwell, which says that we might carve out uh, the major questions doctrine from Chevron. So if an agency makes an interpretation, but it implicates a major question, we don't afford Chevron deference. I don't know if that's going to end up swallowing the rule with Chevron. And I think there's plenty of, of intricate interstitial agency cases where Chevron is going to continue to play a strong role, um, particularly in the lower federal court. So I don't know the direction which the Supreme Court is going on Chevron, but at least as in the lower federal courts, you will see Chevron cited constantly in agency cases because it remains the law of the land. And so until the Supreme Court gives a direction one way or another, yeah, you might have the odd case here where, you know, King v. Burwell is applied and there's some sort of carve out to Chevron. There's various other carve outs to Chevron that uh, courts can do. But again, in, in the mind run of, of cases, um, the question is going to be first, step one, you know, is the, is the statute ambiguous? Um, 
Judge Raymond Ketledge of the Sixth Circuit has a really good piece in, in uh, Vanderbilt's online component um, about ambiguities in agency cases. And I think he says something along the lines of he's never found uh, an agency statute to be ambiguous. And if judges, you know, would just do the work, they would find uh, the, the true meaning of the statute. But, you know, if, if you do get to step two, there seems to be, as, as uh, Professor Philip Hamburger might say, something of a, a bias in favor of the government that we just defer to the government's interpretation. Um, I, you know, that probably is going to end up being worked out through uh, future case law. But uh, I would be surprised if the Supreme Court really just says nothing on Chevron, given the way that it continues to be applied in the lower federal courts. Yeah. Um, and, and I think Justice Scalia, um, you know, in, in uh, I believe in his dissent in the Mead case, um, Chevron keeps things clear. Um, that is, it, it, it helps, it's, it's funny to say clear, because of course, the second step, but the idea being, um, you know, with government doing so many different things at so many different levels and so many different ways, um, there's, you know, something that he valued, which is there's a certainty aspect to it of the two-step rule. Um, and so, Again, from from you know those couple of years that I was at the Federal Communications Commission, um, I'm inclined to think um, well, they can't do away with it. It just it helps keep the world running. It, it, it you know just as, at, at the most practical level. Um, but um, you know I've been wrong before, so. Well, um, I, I, should, I should quickly note you know it's, yeah. it's not clear the way in which Chevron even is supposed to be applied because we have this famous two-step formulation. Step one, you know, it, it did Congress speak clearly to the uh, question issue? And by the way, Tom Merrill has a great book recently where he really excavates the history of the Chevron decision itself and says, read fairly, Chevron doesn't exactly say what we today think it says. But in any event, the, the simplistic, you know, administrative law outline uh, way to, to put it is step one, we ask, is the statute clear? If it's ambiguous, we get to step two. And as long as the agency's uh, construction of the statute was reasonable or permissible, and Professor Merrill thinks those are different things, but reasonable, permissible, we defer to the administrative agency's interpretation so long as, and you can tick down a, you know, a number of things, but for the most part, we defer. So that's when an agency interprets a statute, at least as according to the administrative law outline way you, you put Chevron, but the Supreme Court in, in various cases has either collapsed the framework into basically one step, or it has said that uh, the step two inquiry is basically the, the same inquiry that we do under the arbitrary and capricious standard. And so there's various ways that the court has been kind of doing Chevron. And, you know, back to, to what you said earlier on the, the American Hospital Association Empire Health Foundation cases, you know, those weren't step one cases. The, in the in those cases, the court doesn't mention Chevron. It doesn't say, you know, we do Chevron. And at step one, we ask if the statute is clear and here the statute is clear. They just did statutory interpretation, right? So like, I think even articulation of the framework is in some way important to, to tell what exactly is going on. And it's significant to me that in those cases, they didn't even mention the framework. They just did step one and decided, you know, at step one, we can, we can rule on what the meaning of the statute is. Um, but it, it, there, there's something different about saying we're applying Chevron and we're just happening to end it here at step one. Yes. And, and I think that the, the language um, is right. Because right, step one is clear. I, I think that the way these, the way it's this, you know, used or the way the analysis goes in those cases. And again, based upon Professor um, O'Connell's article, right, it's the argument is this is the best interpretation. This is the best interpretation, um, which um, it, it must be step one because they're resolving it there. And yet, best doesn't negate the possibility of ambiguity. And yet, no one go, it's not going there. That is, the analysis doesn't go there. And I think, you know, uh, um, you know, I think the agencies by and large are, you know, avoiding, avoiding getting into, you know, invoking Chevron um, 
And as I say, 20 years ago, uh, for, for me, it was really, um, you know, it was malpractice not to find an ambiguity. In, in, uh, if you were, you know, I was in the litigation side. And so, of course, you know, you want to get this case to step two as, as uh, uh, you know, to have a fighting chance or more than a fighting chance. Yeah, I should note, you know, nor does saying this is the best interpretation preclude an administrative agency later from overruling the court's interpretation and saying, you know, we find ambiguity here. This is our interpretation. And you didn't say it was the only interpretation. You said it was just the best. And then under brand X, the court has yeah. to defer, defer to, to the that interpretation, yeah. despite it being yeah. contrary to prior judicial precedent. So, you know, we, we can go around the Chevron wheel and, and plenty of law <laughs> professors have made tenure off of Chevron alone. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, yes, well, you know, on, on that note, on, on the jobs program that we uh, that we're all part of in some broad sense, we can end it there. But really, um, it's been uh, so enjoyable uh, to discuss this with you. Um, and um, thank you so much for joining us on the Law Review podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. This was a, a wonderful experience and I really enjoyed chatting with you. Likewise, thanks.